All right. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, tonight's event is a um, human trafficking awareness event, which is sponsored by the Eastland Metal Rotary Club. Um, the reason we chose to do this event as a Rotary Club is because um, earlier this summer, we had um, a speaker come into our club who talked about human trafficking, and it happened to be Anne-Marie Boulay. Um, I'm not sure if you knew this, but at Rotary Club, we have a speaker series that's open to the public in case anyone ever wants to come. But um, you can check out our website. It has a full list of speakers. I just had to do a Rotary Club plug-in. But um, anyway, um, Anne-Marie came in and spoke to our club about human trafficking. And many of us at the meeting that day, we all thought human trafficking is something that happens over there. You know, it doesn't happen in our backyard, it doesn't happen in a town like East Long Meadow, Aguam, Long Meadow, or wherever you're from. It happens over there, big cities, overseas, um, but it's actually not true. Human trafficking actually does happen in our town. It happens in East Long Meadow, it can happen anywhere. And so, in light of that, the fact that many of us within the club did not know much about this, we thought it was really important to educate our community on what is human trafficking, first and foremost, what it looks like, and what we can do about it as a community. And ultimately tonight, it's not about fear or making you afraid or anything like that. It's about educating us, equipping us, and empowering us as adults and as community members so we can be there for our children and youth. Um, so tonight we will have a panel speaker, a list of whole four of us, or five of us, Anne Marie will be the moderator. And um, after their discussion, we'll have a Q&A, so anyone from the audience can open up and ask their questions to these um, panel of experts. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Anne-Marie Boulay, who is the Executive Director of the Underground New England. Really good to be here tonight. You can hear me, right? Way in the back. I'm going to sit. Great. <laughs> um, as Teresa said, she's also my daughter, by the way, so I just love her to pieces, and it is a gift to be here. Um, we did start out with the Rotary Club in East Long Meadow, but we have been at this uh, work of bringing awareness to communities for well over 10 years. And it's a real privilege to be here in East Long Meadow tonight because it's, our, it's where we've grown up. And though we have focused greatly in Connecticut, our desire has been to move into Massachusetts for many, many years. I mean, I live here. And we're well aware of, you know, what trafficking looks like. And I know we're going to talk a lot about Connecticut. Um, but we also want to talk about the fact that our states are right beside each other. I don't want you to think that it wouldn't be happening in Massachusetts. Domestic minor sex trafficking happens in Massachusetts. Our young adults get exploited in Massachusetts. And so tonight's all about, we'll share information about uh, what we've learned in Connecticut, and we're hoping that this will be the first of many opportunities to come bring this kind of message to various cities and towns in Massachusetts so that we can help our kids stay safe. Um, we always start with the very first uh, slide where we talk about the fact that everyone in this room is part of a plan to eradicate child trafficking. You can all help if you are a grandparent in this room tonight, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a mom, dad, teacher, nurse. Um, you could be a captain, which we're very blessed. You could be law enforcement in this room tonight, a state rep, a Rotary Club member. I don't know your your different things that you're all about, but I can promise you, no matter what you do or who you are, you can make a difference in eradicating child trafficking. And we're here because we learned that that was happening in Connecticut. And the reason why we got involved, honey, you wanna hit it? Uh, many years ago, so it was 10 years ago. Let me tell you a little bit about the underground. We got established as a faith-based, 501c3 nonprofit last year in November. We're very proud about that. We've been working at this work for 10 years, as I said. I'm a church leader, so I'm in ministry, and I currently work at Wintonberry Church located in Bloomfield, Connecticut. I've been on their staff for 17 years, and it was about 10 years ago that I started thinking about doing a few other things, and God called me into the work of bringing the church and the communities 
to stand in the gap against anyone or any kind of trafficking or exploitation uh, situation. My work has been to bridge people just like you in this audience tonight in, in the work of the anti-trafficking movement. And there's a lot of ways that we can help. So that's been my work. And I found out that kids were being exploited in Connecticut. I absolutely could not comprehend that. And as a woman who is a leader in a church, and our church was a regional church, so we knew many, many churches in Connecticut, it wasn't something that I could just close my eyes. Yeah, I wasn't going to just go, well, I'm sorry for that, and not do something about it. And so I used that platform to start to teach the church what child trafficking looks like. And we have over 200 churches today that are affiliated with the underground just in Connecticut. I'm hoping to do that in Massachusetts too, because there's all kinds of ways, as I said, you can help. Our vision is to and sexual exploitation in Connecticut, Massachusetts, I don't care what state we're in in New England, we'd love to see it end, and to see a God shift in such a way that compels change in the New England region. And essentially, we just want to see it stop. I already told you, I began in 2012, I was called into this work, but I quickly brought lots of people with me, and because I have many friends in the community, we started doing our work on the Berlin Turnpike. And the Berlin Turnpike spans four cities in um, Connecticut. It's Wethersfield, uh, Newington, Berlin, and Meriden. The Berlin Turnpike looks a lot like Route 5 in West Springfield. So imagine that. It's a regular road. There's some pretty cool things on Route 5 in West Springfield. But just like the Berlin Turnpike, every now and again you're going to see a little motel or hotel. And that's what I was seeing on the Turnpike. And not only that, but we would note that there were many signs that documented hourly rates at motels and hotels. And that's a problem because no one's going into a motel hotel to take a nap, right? It's a problem. And we saw out of the 36 hotels and motels that we studied back 10 years ago that there were 75% of those motels and hotels putting signs out there that we have hourly rates. And I'm going to tell you what I learned back then was that hotels and motels, I actually thought, well, maybe they don't know that child trafficking is happening here. And I learned very quickly from somebody who had been exploited at the age of six. So this little child was exploited on the Berlin Turnpike by her own mom because she was a drug addict. And she was very sick, clearly. And this young one went up and down the Berlin Turnpike. And so years later, we met as an adult. She had come out of the life. And she was able to tell me a little bit about what that looked like on the Berlin Turnpike. And here's what she said. Hotel owners would receive those hourly rates from men or even women who are looking to purchase sex from, from someone. Could be a child, youth, young adult, but someone. So they would pay their hourly rate fee. Then the trafficker who would put people in those rooms would pay a, for a block of rooms and they would pay a fee to the hotel motel owner who, who published hourly rates. And then the third way that they received revenue was from the person who was being victimized. So every time a person who was being victimized was sold or purchased, um, they had to pay a guest fee to the hotel motel owner. So I'm telling you this because that was appalling to me. I was like, wow, how can this be? Um, and I'll tell you, frankly, God used our work because we we snapped pictures, we showed what we found to trafficking in persons, and what ended up happening is they mandated hotels, motels, and probably 20 other different kinds of businesses to post signage that will help people who are being exploited get help. And that's the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And by the way, today, November 11th, is the National Day of Human Trafficking. Sorry? January 11th. I don't know why I said November. Well, I'm combining my birthday month and my and the day. Anyways, January 11th, which is huge. 
that we would stand here in Massachusetts after so long wanting to on the actual day of uh, the National Day of Human Trafficking Awareness. That's a great thing. All of January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and so we're grateful again that you're here and you're willing to hear. We, I just can't thank you enough for being here, and I especially want to thank Teresa and the Rotary Club for bringing us here tonight. We have a panel of experts. I'll tell you a little bit more. Keep going, honey. Here, I'll do it. This is what the underground does, awareness, prevention, survivor support, and we build bridges. We expect that after we leave tonight that we'll have partners. These are the pa partners that we have in Connecticut. Um, certainly the Department of Children and Families is an important partner in this work, and you have that kind of um, organization right here in this state. They're gonna understand what children are most uh, vulnerable. So that's an important partnership. We partner with trafficking in persons, law enforcement, DCF, as I've already said, uh, Homeland Security, FBI, state, local police. Uh, we also have many different um, providers in our state of Connecticut that we partner with, and we long to do that here, um, right here in Mass. So I'm gonna turn it over to Yvette Young. So on this panel tonight, um, are experts in the field. Yvette Young is um, a vice president of the Village for Families and Children. She has also been part of the HEART team in significant ways. She's a co-chair of the Connecticut HEART team, and that stands for Human Anti-Trafficking Response Team. And that team meets periodically to go over cases. They're called multidisciplinary uh, teams that come together. So law enforcement will sit at that table. Uh, medical people will sit at that table. DCF, uh, the US, a faith-based initiative, all of the providers in the state. And Yvette used to coordinate everything that was going on in HEART for the first five years after they received a grant. She's an expert when it comes to child trafficking. We're sharing a little bit of curriculum tonight, and then we really want to move on to a couple of important stories and hear from Captain Brian. So I'm gonna hand it over to Yvette. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you, Henry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming and allowing yourself to be um, educated on this very important topic. So when I start my presentation, I always um, reference Brene Brown's vulnerability research. So in her research, she talked about the fact that when folks are feeling vulnerable, your brain sort of creates a story to help protect you. So it convinces you that you're going to be okay. Whether or not you are going to be okay or not, it convinces you that you are, and you start to create a narrative or a story for protection. So I took that and I thought about it in the context of human trafficking, and I say, what is the story we tell ourselves about human trafficking? And if you sit with that for a minute, there's a story that will surface for you about what your perception is about what human trafficking is. And what I've learned through the years, doing awareness events like this, doing trainings, is that the story most people tell themselves about human trafficking is it's never going to happen to my child and it doesn't happen in my community. And that is a myth that we will dispel tonight as we have this conversation because even though the data we'll be sharing is from Connecticut, it's similar data in Mass and similar data in all other states. There's national statistics about human trafficking and there is no state because Polaris has a map that they um, put up every year and every part of the United States have trafficking activity, some more than others. But we always say, even if it seems like it's low, that means that there is not enough awareness and that there's not enough identification of victims in that particular state. So to get started, I wanted to um, do the definition for you. I have my notes in front of me. So we use the Trafficking Victims Protection Act definition when we talk about human trafficking. Um, and that definition pretty much says that human trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision of obtaining a person for two reasons, sex trafficking or labor trafficking. And when we talk about sex trafficking, we're talking about a commercial sex act. So any uh, exchange of sex for anything of value. So an exchange of sex for anything of value through the use of force, fraud, or coercion is automatically considered sex trafficking. But in the case of minor children, so anyone under the age of 18 years old, as long as there's an exchange of sex for anything of value, it is automatically sex trafficking. Um, that's the federal definition. And then on the labor trafficking side, for both children and adults, 
you do have to prove force, fraud, and coercion in order for it to be considered labor trafficking. And when we talk about labor trafficking, we're talking about domestic servitude, bondage, et cetera, right? Um, individuals who are working without pay, living in conditions that are deplorable, um, you know, folks who their visa or paperwork have been taken from them, and they're forced to work without um, any compensation. Um, so we have labor trafficking as well. In the state of Connecticut, we've seen a lot of cases on sex trafficking, so a lot of our statistics focus on that. Um, and on the labor trafficking side, we've had a few cases, but um, only a few. So um, we have created a curriculum on labor trafficking because we really do feel that awareness leads to identification. And so we're hoping the more we talk about labor trafficking as it relates to children, we will start to see more cases um, on that side. So when we talk about victims of human trafficking, pretty much, I mean, the slide is up there and there's a lot of details, but in summary, human trafficking does not discriminate. It doesn't matter what your race, ethnicity is, religious background, uh, what community you live in. Um, anyone can be a, a victim of human trafficking. Any child can be a victim of human trafficking. And the reason for that is that our children are vulnerable, and vulnerability is one of the hugest factors for kids being um, lured into a life of trafficking. And when we talk about the different ways and pathways that traffickers get access to kids, you'll see how very easy and simple and quick um, it is for a trafficker to lure a child um, into a life of trafficking. So keep that in mind. There are certain vulnerabilities like poverty and trauma and previous exploitation. So children who have been previously sexually abused or um, have physical abuse or neglect, those kids are at a higher percent rate of being re-victimized through trafficking than a child that hasn't. But it doesn't mean that a child who has not received or had experienced abuse can't be trafficked either. So if you have children in your sphere, whether your own children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, et cetera, if you're not talking to them about this issue, they're vulnerable to be trafficked. Right. So what are some of the types of human trafficking or pathways to human trafficking? The most prominent one is uh, internet-based trafficking. So uh, what we had, and you know, we had Backpage, we had Craigslist, there was a lot of sites that were posting children in their escort sections. And they were posting them as older than 18, but they were actually minors. Um, and then people would see the ads and would call and solicit um, and exploit the children. Um, one of the statistics uh, that we utilize is that over 70% of our kids are being trafficked online. So they're being, I always say they're being bought and sold online. Um, and in the documentary, I Am Jane Doe, one of the commentators said, you can purchase, purchase a child in 30 minutes, the same thing as purchasing a pizza. In 30 minutes, you call you, you say, I'm interested in that particular child, and that child is brought to your home, a hotel room, for you to exploit them. 30 minutes or less, and that child is being victimized, right? So traffickers have a way of grooming. So we talk a lot about grooming when we talk about online solicitation, where they will um, friend request your children. Um, the kids will be like, okay, whatever, someone wants to be my friend, I don't care, so they accept them. The trafficker gets to learn more about them, read their profile, see who their friends is, where do they go to school, what are their interests? And then before you know it, they start to direct message them. And because they know so much about them, the kid feels like, well, this person seems like they're pretty safe. And they'll offer them things and they're nice to them. You know, there's no threat, it feels safe. You know, someone cares about me, they love me, they want to give me things. Why wouldn't I say yes, right? And so they use those tactics and then they lure those children in. Before you know it, they're having to meet them at places in the community or they're driving in your driveway and picking them up when you're not at home and then they're going and exploiting them. So we see a lot of the victimization happen that way. In um, 2020, when we were locked down and COVID was happening, a lot of kids were home. A lot of kids were on their computers because they had to do it for school. And um, NICMIC, which is a National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, so a 98% increase in online solicitation of children that year. 98%. Because now traffickers had them right at their beck and call and was um, making attempts to exploit. Um, so some of the other avenues is we have individuals who start out maybe in a strip club and then you know is outsourced um, and being trafficked that way. We have a male survivor that we're aware of who started stripping in high school and that was a gateway for him eventually being um, trafficked. You have kids who are trafficking each other. So we're in high school. High school students throw parties if your parents are not around. And you will have other high school students. So it's not just adults that are trafficking children. 
So you may have a boyfriend girlfriend situation and the boyfriend said, hey, I'll have my girlfriend have sex with you if you bring alcohol to the party or if you bring drugs or if you do whatever. And so that is because if you go back to the definition, the exchange of sex for anything of value is sex trafficking. So even though that is a minor, it doesn't mean that they're not trafficking another minor. So we see a lot of that. We see a lot of recruitment by minors of other minors um, into the life as well. So you have to also be mindful of the influence of children and who your children are around as well. Um, we have interfamilial trafficking, and that is pretty much when a parent or guardian or family member traffics their child. So Emory mentioned um, the case where it was a six-year-old child or mom trafficked her. In Connecticut, the youngest victim on record is a two-year-old child. That child was trafficked by his uncle, and the next child was four years old. The youngest child was four years old, and his dad, who was a doctor, was trafficking him to other doctors in his network, right? And what we see is that 30% nationally human trafficking cases are interfamilial. And usually in interfamilial cases, it's young children that are being trafficked, not adolescent age as much, right? It's younger kids who typically are trafficked in that form. So as you can see, there is um, all sort of forums as far as kids who are runaway kids who are trafficking, and we call it survival sex in order to be able to survive. You have marriage um, trafficking when you have kids under the age of 18 who are married off. Um, we're seeing that that's definitely a concern or an issue because the parent could be the trafficker and selling their child to this person who's quote unquote marrying them um, as a minor. And usually it's not same age marriages, it's usually an older adult marrying an adolescent age child. And then we talked about labor trafficking as well. So, so, so some statistics, and this is, as I said, Connecticut data, um, but hopefully the captain will be able to give you some perspective on your region as far as what the numbers look like here in Mass. But in 2022, at the beginning of the um, year, we were seeing that our numbers were dramatically increasing and that about halfway through the year, they had already hit 100 referrals, which was extremely high uh, for the department. The year prior to that, you can go to the next slide. The, the year prior to that, there was 241 cases, and these are unique cases of minors in Connecticut that were either at risk or confirmed victims of human trafficking. Majority of those victims are girls. Um, we do have a small percentage of boys who are trafficked, but what we do know from national statistics is that 30% of trafficking victims' children are boys. But in our state, we don't see that number, and one of the reasons is that people don't look for this in boys. They don't pay attention to the warning signs in boys. They're thinking, no, a boy can't be victimized in this way. And so we have a lot of male victims that are not identified and usually we don't identify them until they're adult survivors. So what we also have seen in our data, and this is also national, is the majority of children who are being trafficked are children of color. Um, it definitely is a major issue of concern. Uh, that we have to focus on and address and figure out how we, you know, eliminate that from happening. But a, a big piece of the puzzle with children who are from communities of color is that there is a vulnerability that exists for those children, um, and traffickers and buyers will exploit that vulnerability in our kids. And so the last one is placement and time of victimization. And what we've seen over the last, like, what, eight years now? is that the majority of children who are trafficked are, are living at home with a parent or guardian. So a lot of times when you hear national statistics and conversations about human trafficking, it's kids who live in foster care, kids who are in child welfare. Those are the kids who are being trafficked. And what we started to see in our Connecticut data was that's actually not true. The majority of the kids are living right at home with a parent or guardian, may not have any DCF involvement whatsoever or child welfare whatsoever, involved, but their kids are being exploited. And people are like, how could that happen? They're at home. Then their parents realize that they're missing because yet again, what's the story we tell ourselves about human trafficking? It's the movie Taken. It's kids being abduct abducted. It's kids who live in foreign countries. But the reality is your child living at home, online, solicited by someone. The person says, meet me. They meet them at school. They meet them after school. They find, um, have the child tell you stories and excuses about where they're going who they're with, so, oh, I'm gonna go visit my friend um, Susie down the road and I'm gonna spend you know, a couple of hours with her. Those couple of hours, she's not with Susie, but she's with, with the trafficker who is exploiting her. And usually parents are extremely devastated when they discover that their children are being trafficked. 
And I'll just do a quick case before um, we go to the video to just show that this is not just an issue of kids in poverty or kids who have, you know, the typical vulnerabilities. But there was a case in Connecticut, 14 year old girl, high school girl. She started high school. Um, she was wanted to belong. So belonging was her vulnerability to this popular clique of kids in the school. And so they told her, listen, you know, you want to be a part of our crew. This is what we do. You have to go and have sex with men for, for money, for goods, for property, whatever. This was a child that lived in an affluent community. Her parents were not in need or want of financial resources. Um, she had no involvement with DCF or with any social service agency. And she got lured into the life of trafficking. The way her parents discovered this was her grades started to drop. She was having issues in school. And they thought she was using drugs because that's the automatic place that minds go. They went in her room, started to search her room, found a diary, and in her diary, she had a ledger of all the people she had had sex with and what she had received from them. And they were mortified. So they called DCF to see what help they can receive. I tell that story because I think sometimes when we live in communities that feel safe, that seem like there's no reason why this would happen in my community, that we then start to think, like I said, not my child, not my community. It's only happening in Springfield, right? In the inner cities, in the more urban neighborhoods. And that is not accurate. Children who are living in affluent communities are being victimized as well. And the problem is that they don't have enough knowledge to equip them to protect themselves against traffickers. And that is one of the biggest reasons why our kids are vulnerable to being victimized. So with that, what I'm gonna do is show you a video. It's a spoken word video from Love 146 which is one of our providers in the state of Connecticut. It does a really good job about talking about what it means to be victimized and also what it means to be a survivor of this crime. While he's getting that, one second, honey. Yeah, don't do it yet. Um, first off, just wanna say Yvette Young is awesome and we're grateful to her for peace. Yeah. And she's even done a podcast, so you can find her if you Google her. Um, but I, or TED Talk, there you go. Um, I wanted to say that the information that we're giving you tonight is heavy and it's hard and it can sometimes hurt your heart, especially before you see this video. It's, you know, it's somebody's um, words, right, that they've, they're about to share, but it isn't easy to hear the things that we're telling you. And so if you need to take a moment and walk out of this auditorium, we understand. Um, if you need to uh, take a bathroom break, go for it. But know that at the end of this, right, we are gonna give you time to ask your questions and even process a little bit, because it's hard. And uh, after this video, I think I'm gonna have, well, even before this video, I would like Jermika just to share a story she was telling me about today so that you get a sense of what this looks like and why it's important for you to know this because Yvette said 70% of our reports in Connecticut are kids being uh, at least groomed online and every child seems to have a device these days. So I want uh, my friend Jermika, Jermika Cost is our, uh, our, our board of directors secretary um, she's got loads of gifts, has served in many different capacities in nonprofits. And um, yeah, she's awesome. She's got her own business and her business sends proceeds to the anti-trafficking movement, a, a portion of those. Just like Marianne and her business reads for a reason. They send proceeds, a portion of them, actually all of them in their case, to the anti-trafficking movement. And so uh, Jermika shared a story with me today and I really want you to hear it. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Anne-Marie stated, I have been walking alongside the underground for about seven years. So all of the information, trainings, and different things, the first place I bring it is home. Um, I have a 17-year-old and I have a three-year-old and I have a husband. And so for the last seven years, my teenager has been learning about anti-trafficking, learning about social media, um, how to be safe online, et cetera. And um, yesterday, so I'll go back, she's a senior. And so I thought, let's loosen the reins a little bit. Because of the knowledge that I've gained, I wasn't ready to not monitor 
our devices. And so I would I have an app, like many parents do, I hope they do, um, to monitor what communications are going in and out on her device. But I have communicated with her that she's aware. So she knows that I am watching the devices and, and we have open communication. But um, yesterday I felt uneasy because it had been a while since I had kind of looked at the device, again, trying to wean myself and see how she's growing up. And um, I had a conversation with her this morning and I said, let's take a look at it together. And we sat and we took a look at it together and she was on an a app that she had never been on before. Um, it's called Snapchat. She never really used it, but all the friends at school were starting to use it to communicate together across their devices, which I thought was fine. But then there was a message in the group that I didn't recognize the name because I'm familiar with her friends. And I asked her, well, who is this? And she said, it's a friend of a friend at school that I know. So I said, oh, okay, so how did your friend meet this friend? And she said, well, I don't know, but they introduced me to them in December. So I said, okay, well, I just wanna look through the thread. And the more I looked through the thread, I realized five out of the seven keys that I've noticed, uh, of, I think it's actually from level 46, things to look for when you are being groomed, et cetera, we're there. And so we're getting ready for school and now we're having a conversation about my concerns about this app and, and the communications. And now, can I just say this really quick? My daughter is like one of those young women who would get a bird outside that fell and like try to bring it back to life. So she's, it's hard for her at times to think that someone could do such a thing. So she's taken the information I've given, but not really applied it to like her daily life. And so the more we talked about it, I said, well, who's the person that gave it to you? What's their relationship? And the more she told me about how they met, et cetera, this person lives in the UK for what's on the internet. And so the more she told me about the connection, the more the signs just kept coming up. And so, even though I've given the information, even though my husband and I are home, even though we have parental controls, yet it showed up at our doorstep. All the signs, let me say that, are at our doorstep. And so, um, yeah, we've been dealing with those conversations today with the school system, superintendents, because just because it showed up at my doorstep, that tells me something else is looming. There's other conversations that need to be had. And so that's where we are. We're going to keep going with it. One of the things that Jermika told me today is that there were signs that her daughter was being groomed. And that is deeply concerning. So this person represents themselves from the UK, starts out with a very nice conversation with her daughter, and eventually starts talking about male genitals. That's a problem. No, listen, if <laughs> that is not a friend. Right? And that's what's happening to our kids. They start off with these very nice conversations and, you know, her daughter's telling this, per this person, saying, I have so many needs out in the UK, telling her all her problems, kind of saying to her, hey, you're the sunshine in my life. And the little one's like, well, I love you. I'm here for you. She doesn't know her daughter. And then the conversation starts moving toward private parts. That, that is the kind of stuff that people who are looking to exploit little ones are doing. And then our kids are like, I don't even know how I got here. And then they're snapping pictures and they're moving on. And then that picture, especially if it's any kind of nudity, becomes pornography that's been distributed. I mean, it is not good. And we have got to have lots of conversations with our kids. If you, if you want to learn more about that, there's a friend out in the audience, Pauline. She's got a clipboard. If you just share your name and email, it'll remain confidential, but we'll send you some resources and you'll learn how to have some of these conversations with your children in order for them to say, stay safe online. I don't know how many uh, folks in here have the young one in their life, but you must know, like between the cell phone, the iPad, the computer, even the gaming, Gaming, I'll tell you what, 
that is a very big place of vulnerability for our kids. So if you will connect with us, we'll send some stuff out to you to help your kids stay safe online. And Pauline's here somewhere. She, it's just a clipboard. If you could share your information, we'd appreciate it. And let it go around the room. Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna show that video. Um, so in the beginning of this video, there is some strong language, so don't be too altered. Um, but and it's a spoken word video um, that Love One Forty Six sort of contracted because they wanted to find different ways to educate our youth and to educate adults around this issue. Um, not clear if she's a survivor or not, but um, it is um, a powerful piece of uh, video. Worthless, dumb slut, faggot, punk. They called her number 146. Maybe you know the sting like razor blades. Maybe the desire to disappear, it resonates. Maybe you too know the feel of forgettable, that ache that lingers inside you like the taste of the last cigarette on the tongue, but the pain in your body because the work is never done. Maybe you know the sound. The sound of your dreams being crumpled into the dollar in someone else's jeans, like when your parents or your friend or the man down the street tried to pimp your self-esteem. At first, they called you pretty. Then they called you weak, good for nothing, never be worth much. Every syllable in your beautiful name and the story behind it exchanged for slurs. They've broken down your spine, sanded down your shine, and branded you with their labels. Next, they'll put you in a box to put you on the shelf, hoping you'll be picked before your expiration date, but your soul is not damaged goods. We won't be fooled by those who only care about us long enough to make money off us, make us packageable, profitable, those who treat people like products, turning children into chattel, the vulnerable into victims, and maybe you've been told you deserve that this is all you'll ever get, so shut up and be happy. Be happy somebody wants you. But you will not be happy with their minutes. You will not be bought and sold at a discount. Don't count your past against you. A few mistakes just gives your skin that human hue, that hue that says, I've been put into dark places and did not stay there. So don't dance in their dark roots. Don't pose for their cameras because your portrait's worth a thousand words, all more beautiful than the ones you were told. Irreplaceable, unconquerable, unstoppable. You might be fractured, but unlike a fraction, you cannot be reduced. Tell them. My life is not mathematics. I'm not a statistic, not a hashtag, not a price tag. I am not a number. I have a story. A story that includes love. And survival is just the beginning. I don't have all the answers or any easy solutions, and I don't really know how this ends. But your story is yours. It's what's behind the eyes and cannot be commodified. Thank you. Um. You know, the underground's work, it, one of the four things is to bring direct supports to victims and survivors. And we learn our people's stories, like when they're coming out of the street and out of crisis and we help them get stable. And as we do that, we're hearing their stories. We're not about judging. We wanna absolutely be open to their experiences. Yvette's about to shift now and talk about the signs and indicators of what child trafficking looks like. And then I think we're gonna move to our captain on this bench so that we can hear from him. But these are, these are some of the red flags. I don't know that you'll go over all of them, but you'll see the screen behind you. And we again, appreciate you so much. Thanks, Emery. Um, one of the things, I absolutely love that video because one, it's, it just really hits you where it needs to. Um, in the heart in regards to the compassion and empathy you need to have for those who are victimized and sort of the pain and struggle that they go through as, as victims. 
The other powerful part about this video is that in any room, in any space that we go into, there's survivors. Whether that they identify as survivors or not, they're in the space. And I think the beauty of that video, especially near the end of that spoken word video, is it's affirming. So if there's anyone in the space who is struggling and going through and have never been affirmed and told that it was not their fault and that they didn't deserve what happened, this is a moment of awakening for, for some folks. And so I also value and appreciate it for being able to do that for someone in this moment. So when we talk about the impact of human trafficking on our children, and, and these are impacts that we're seeing in our kids, not adults, but in our children. Um, the st national statistics is that for most human trafficking victims, they have to have sex with five, between five to 25 buyers per night, per night. Um, and so when you think about that, five to 25, <coughs> the damage that that does to someone's physical body and someone's psychological health. And so a lot of the damages that we see, which is a slide that you have in front of you, is substance use. So we have a lot of times where victims stay in the life because their traffickers um, force them to take drugs to do what they want them to do. They become addicted to the substance and now they're staying in to continue to feed that addiction. Um, so we see a lot of substance abuse issues with survivors, a lot of psychological trauma. These are rapes. Right? So we say, use the word sex, but it's not sex, it's rape. And so you have five to 25 rapes per night. Imagine the psychological impact and the trauma that that is creating for that young child. Um, you have medical problems. A lot of times with traffickers, if, especially if the child is a runaway and they don't have access to family or friends or resources, they're not taking care of their medical needs. If, a, if someone gets pregnant, they're aborting that pregnancy, and it's not by going to a facility to do it, it's by any means necessary, right? Um, if they have um, medical issues, diabetes, juvenile diabetes, any of those things, asthma, et cetera, they're not treating it, right? They're not getting the care they need, so a lot of kids end up with medical issues or complicated medical issues. Bruises and scars, it's not only the trafficker that beats these um, victims, it's also the buyers. So we, we are going to talk a little bit about tra traffickers and buyers, but we need to understand that people who are buying our children are not very nice people. And they're not buying them because they love them and care for them. They're buying them to abuse them. And that's exactly what they'll do um, to our kids. As a result of all of the um, trauma, vaginally and rectally, you have a lot of um, kids who end up with fertility issues um, and probably will never have children in their entire life, even after getting out of the life. Sexually transmitted diseases, HIV AIDS, the whole gamut um, they're exposed to. Um, unwanted pregnancy, dental problems, and the list just continues to go on. Um, so this is not, um, you know, you see sometimes people glorify victimization. The aftermath is not at all pretty. And so some of the red flags, and I'll quickly go through this because I know we have a lot of content to cover. So some of the things to keep an eye out for. Um, frequent went away, so kids who are missing, definitely, where are they? Like, I, sometimes I wonder where people ask that question. A child has run away, they have no money, no resources. Someone is taking care of them. Someone is providing for them. And typically it's someone who's abusing them, right? So anytime a child is missing for a period of time, the likelihood is that they're being trafficked um, because they need the resources or the person, you know, is threatening them. Um, kids who show up with excessive amounts of cash, to, uh, phones, any gift a child has that they cannot explain where it came from and you cannot validate that it came from that source, so they come home and be like, oh, my friend's mom bought me this new pair of shoes. Are you calling the friend's mom to ask, hey, did you buy my child this particular item? Or are you just assuming that whatever the child says to you is accurate, but in actuality, it's a trafficker that bought them those new pairs of shoes, right? So being paying attention to those things that just seem odd and out of place with your kids. Um, Kids who use language of the life, so if you start to hear terminologies like daddy, the life, pimp, trick, all those kinds of language, you're like, where they're hearing this from? Who's exposing them to this content? You have to ask questions. You have to dive deeper. You are not going to assess human trafficking by one question. It's going to take a series of questions and exploration to really figure out if your child is being trafficked. Um, there's the, the typical ones about identification, but that's usually if someone discovers a child. Another thing that we've seen in the state is um, kids who are being tattooed or branded by their traffickers. We had one victim who the trafficker tattooed a bunny sign on her face because that's what she was working in. You have kids who have barcodes on their necks. 
because yet again, that's what they are worth. And it's a way for them, the traffickers, to mark them so that no other trafficker tried to access them because that's their property. That's how these children are being, are being viewed. Um, a lot of kids become, you know, as I said, have a lot of emotional range of reaction. So from your depressive kids to your very aggressive or angry kids, because what they're experiencing on a daily basis, most of us as adults could not even tolerate um, for an hour even. Um, and they live in that reality on a regular basis. So we really do need to, to pay attention. Pay attention, ask questions. When you see a shift in mood behavior, um, you know, new friends, new company, see who, like Jamika said, who are they talking to? Because the likelihood is someone in that group or circle is likely to exploit them. Do you want to do so, so, those steps or move on? You can so I'm going to end there. Um, we can talk about steps to prevention near the end or when we're answering questions so that we can give them. That's all right, right? I'm going to stand up just because it seems like I should be standing up and not sitting down talking in uniform. <laughs> so I'm sitting here with kind of a blank stare on my face, and I, I realize that, but the, the reality of it is, is that I'm having this conversation or hearing this conversation and I'm being reminded of things that uh, I've spent the last eight years trying to forget. Um, in 2015 I was given the task of taking on a unit in downtown Springfield. Um, there were four units deployed throughout the city. Um, I'll give a quick context because I failed to give a bio because uh, I was a little busy. Um, I've been with the Springfield Police Department going on my 30th year. Um, in 30 years, I spent 18 in patrol, uh, predominantly in Forest Park. Uh, I did time as a lieutenant in uh, narcotics and firearms for three years, up until about eight months ago. Um, I am our tactical team, our SWAT team commander. I currently do that. And then uh, my role now is I write policy for the city of Springfield as a captain. Um, the video that we just watched, um, I've been with that person in one form or another on multiple occasions. Um, it's as real as it gets. It's okay to not know that this exists. Um, it's meant to be discreet. Um, and you find as time goes on that there's a you know, I was speaking with the chief, and it's, it's kind of like Microsoft. It's kind of like an operating system. It's just, it's always running. It's always going in the background. You don't see it, but it's there. Um, when I took on the task in 2015 of addressing um, the problems in the south end of Springfield, it was because the, the area was notorious for prostitution activity. So, you know, doing what cops do, we... We wanted to find a, a better way of locking up prostitutes. So we went to different departments, Worcester, Providence, Rhode Island, um, who had uh, similar problems and uh, tried to kind of build a better mousetrap, like how we were going to catch more prostitutes. But we were still operating from the paradigm that the problem was the workers. So uh, during that meeting, we left there, I go to Worcester Court, and I have the pleasure of sitting down with a, a survivor. And so, I, be, you know, I become hip to the term survivor. And as I sit there and I listen to this woman tell, my, tell her story, it crushes you to hear it. And realize what she had been through and, and where she was at this point. And she was uh, going to great steps to advocate to help, for people, help other, other survivors. But it was that moment that we had this kind of aha where I was doing it wrong. What we were looking to do to solve the problem was, was not appropriate. Again, it was the traditional law enforcement response, right? Let's just lock everybody up, it's gonna go away. So we shifted to the demand. So we enlisted the help from the judiciary, uh, local uh, legislators, um, city council, and we revamped our structures within the police department and we started attacking the, the demand side of things. Um, so 
we started arresting Johns. And so John after John after John after John after John, I mean, probably literally in, a, in an area that spans two blocks, 150, 160 arrests, different people. Um, we started looking at the workers. So we went from prostitutes to commercially sexually exploited persons because obviously we couldn't pinpoint whether it was male or female. So um, what well, we knew, but, it, but obviously to their point, it, it, it just runs the gamut. So a lot of drug dependency issues, mental health issues, and so we started to look at the workers and provide them with services to get them out of their life. So one that kind of hits home for me is a, a girl that lived under a bridge with a, a, an addict, and she was um, partnered with another addict, and she was pregnant, and she was living under a bridge. So myself and my team, one officer in particular, we, we put ourselves out there, we provided her with every service we could, and then two months went by without hearing from her. Uh, we get a letter that she's writing uh, to him from her own kitchen table on her own cell phone that she had had the baby, the baby was healthy, that her boyfriend was in jail, and that uh, she was attending church and she was doing good. Yeah. And then three months later, she was bound in a cellar dead. So, So, you can't give up. You have to keep moving forward. But they're out there, they exist. Um, the people that do this, there's no other way to describe it but that they're animals. Um, I, I question my uh, sanity in agreeing to come and speak today. But uh, like I said, I, I was out of this for a while. And then, but I understand that what we did, what we changed on the law enforcement side was we looked at it from just the suppression piece to prevention, intervention, and suppression, right? We did everything we could, we do everything we can to work with groups like this, to, to work with groups like you, to try to increase awareness, to try to prevent this before it happens, the, those, those um, cues, those signs, to get people out of the life before it starts to identify those in the life and to try to do everything we can with partners to pull them back from the life. And if we can't get to that, well then we have to do what we have to do and that, and that becomes what, what you see or identify as the traditional police response. We've done hotel stings. We've done hotel stings where we had officers who were clearly uh, young in their appearance and they were identified in online ads as being 14, 15 years old and people lined up to come. And I think that one, we, I think we had about eight arrests for people that had planned on coming to have sex with 14 and 15 year old girls. Um, we've done, you know, the reverse things where we've used officers on the street to, to uh, solicit business and made arrests that way. So there, this is a multifaceted approach. We've hit massage parlors where for the perspective of labor trafficking, we've opened safes on warrants and found stacks of passports because people were coming in from New York, they would take all of their paperwork, secret their paperwork away, and then force them to, to work, and then load them up and rotate them back out through uh, to New York, and then come back up again. Uh, that one particular time that we did it, we hit two locations in Springfield, a location in Agawam, a location in East Long Meadow, and a location in West Springfield. So again, this spans all of our communities. It, it, it's happening, it's happening right now. While we're sitting here, it's happening. So the only thing that I can say is that I will certainly provide any and all resources that I have available to me, to this group, to get you up and running here. Um, and that, um, you know, Homeland, does a great job with us. Mass State Police does a great job. Um, law enforcement in general, 
does a good job. I think we finally got a, a, a better understanding of what the problem was and that, uh, and as a result, I think it's, uh, it's been more productive. But I mean, uh, I don't know, it's, it, it, it crushes you. I, I, I wish I hadn't seen half the things I've seen, but I, I can't undo that. And I, I just continue to do what I do because I know it's the right thing to do. But I appreciate you and what you do, and I thank you for allowing me to speak today. But if uh, if I kept telling stories, we'd be out of here tomorrow. So, <laughs> but again, thank you. I know. I thank you so much, Captain Brian. He's a he's actually a friend of my husband's, a dear friend, best friend. <laughs> And Brian, my husband, Brian Boulay, who's the only one you haven't met yet, is someone who helps in great ways at the Underground New England, but especially he has some work going when it comes to demand. So we're probably going to want to come back to you, Captain, to hear more about what Springfield's doing, because Connecticut doesn't have quite that piece going on, and we'd like to change that. I just had a conversation with trafficking in persons about that just yesterday, so... We're excited to have your acquaintance, and we're looking forward to learning from Massachusetts what we can do different in Connecticut, and that's really what this is all about. So Yvette just mentioned that typically we will speak to you about buyers, um, or the Johns, as Captain said, and traffickers, uh, or the pimps, you might know them as. I'm gonna skip lots of things. I just wanna show you this, this quick uh, six pictures. These are all folks that were arrested in the state of Connecticut. I just want you to notice, and these are traffickers. I want you to notice that there's males here, there's women, there's even a young boy. I just want you to notice that anybody, as Yvette said regarding victims, it doesn't matter the background of a person when it comes to being victimized. It's the same for a trafficker, it could be anybody. We've arrested, you know, teachers, coaches, priests, you know. I mean, I, she just told you about a doctor that trafficked their own child. I mean, it can be anybody. Um, so buyers, you know, same kind of thing. I mean, he told you about a sting he conducted. I want to say in Connecticut years ago, it was back in 2018, they put two lines. They put two sex ads, rather, online, just two, of 14-year-old girls that they were saying, hey, you can purchase these girls. There were over 5,000 hits in 30 days. It's in Guilford, Connecticut, right? He's saying little tiny town, Guilford, beach town. Not cool. So there's demand for this, right? Like, we shall not fool ourselves, right? Like there's demand for this. And so we can change that though. And that's where I really wanna just leave you with one little please. Just take a few minutes to hear this video. These are men and women, young adults, that the underground has been helping through a mentor program. And as sad as that story was that Captain just told us about the young lady who was moving into steps of freedom, right? The thing is, when people come out of the life of exploitation, you have got to meet them where they're at and then escort them into a new life. That doesn't happen in a moment. It takes a long time. And we, our work is to stand with victims and survivors and help them transition into freedom and liberty. I just want to hear, I just need to give you a little bit of hope before we open to question and answers so that you can hear how this work matters in people's lives. We need connection. We crave it. And there are people who take advantage of that. And they usually don't care if you're already broken. Nobody knows what that life is like. And the underground, they understand. They have people like me who are survivors that work with survivors just for that reason.
the underground. They helped me so much with, uh, with my journey. It took one conversation of admitting what was going on for my whole life to change. It's a beautiful thing to be able to move forward in life and to not have to look back anymore. It's amazing that people are going to be getting the help that I didn't have at the time. If I had that help, I probably would have stopped what I was doing a lot sooner. I don't know if this would have made sense to me if I was not trafficked, but as being a survivor and to have those available, you know, I'm almost 50 years old and I don't have a GED. What happens if I had a tutor 20 years ago? You know, why did I have to learn how to read and write in prison? This spares the pain of so many. And we will create a place that someone can come and be broken. Someone can come and not have to pretend and have that happen without any expectations, without any demands, with gentle hands. Something like that would have changed my life. I personally am honored to be working with others and helping them on their pathway to healing and freedom. And I couldn't honestly imagine doing anything else. We already started the race. We just need the endurance. We needed the backing to, to finish this, to stay on straight so we can help those that are unseen. When it comes to the people that give, they're not just buying a house in office space, they're saving lives and souls. Every dime they put in there is to find a survivor who's lost. I just, I just had to play that for you. Um, those folks are our people, right? Like, so I just want you to understand, we met these people at the point of exiting a life of exploitation, and they were in crisis and we moved them from crisis to stability, and we mentored them into liberation. The very people you just heard all went through our program and are now some of our employees with lived experience. And there's nobody like a person with lived experience to help somebody else get out of that life of exploitation. We need to praise God for tonight. We really appreciate you being here, whoever your God is. We have time for answers, uh, questions, if you've got questions, we've got answers. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so if you would like to use those microphones over there, yep, our panel will be happy to answer your questions. I just want to mention that two of those voices you heard there are two survivors that we met three years ago. And they actually, we actually got to attend their wedding last year. Yeah, or actually it was in 21. It was in 21 they got married, yeah, two years ago year and a half ago, so um, so I just tell you that because you, know, you see, Ryan, these are hard stories to, to listen to, to really listen to, to hear the details. But if you listen to those stories, you get to maybe see a really beautiful story, like I know that that's a beautiful story, only because I listened to their really hard story. So if you're sitting there like, I don't know if I can do this, well, maybe you can also be part of a beautiful story. So don't be frightened off by the darkness of it. I'm good. I'm going to go big. <laughs> 30 years ago, I wanted to, I tried to figure out why I wanted to be a police officer. The reason I wanted to be a police officer is because I wanted to put myself in a position to be able to help people, right? And it wasn't just because, you know, I could show up and uh, you got a car accident or whatever else, but like, you could actually put yourself in a position to have the access and the availability of resources to put those resources in play to help people out, right? So it's easy to do nothing, right? It's easy to say I'm aware of it. It's easy to speak to it and say, no, I know what happens and it's horrible, right? But it's another thing to do something, right? I don't know how many people in this room can say it. I don't know how many people can say it nationally, internationally, or whatever else, but if 
how many people actually can say, I saved a life, right? I saved somebody, right? And so I've been fortunate or unfortunate, however you want to look at it, to be put in a position to save a lot of people, some physically from harm and others by helping them with their path. And if I had only done that once in a 30-year career, then I would have said, mission accomplished, right? Life well lived. But I did more than that, and I was fortunate. And this group, just hearing the changes, the people who come out of this and are, are survivors and truly do survive, that is, that is without, without measure, without compare. So I would just implore that knowledge is power, right? And understanding that the problem exists is one thing. But actually doing something about it to change it, it it's, it's irreplaceable, right? So like, just hear this, hear this message, try to do something, try to help. And, and, and if everybody in this room saved one person, Right? Think about what we could accomplish, right? And I want to say, Brian, I've known him for 41 years, and he is the gentlest, most magnificent human being that I could ever want to know, which is the only reason why I'm even here. <laughs> <laughs> but he, we were in New York City, and we were having a conversation, and he, um, I, I was at their wedding, I don't even know how long ago what that was. How many, how many? 27, years. 27 years ago, I was at their wedding. Um, but when this was only in August, when I found out what Emory was doing, and I just was like, nah, it's a no-brainer. We, we have to do this. We have to help out, right? So just, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of this for me that I just don't want to redo or relive, but that's okay because the successes outweigh the failures or losses tenfold, and so that's what makes it okay, and that's why we keep doing what we do. So I just, I truly believe in this, I believe in this work, um, and I just would ask that everybody here just commits to this if they can, and, and realizes that it's worthwhile, and that, like, this just needs to be done, because there are so many people out there that need our help, uh, and they might not know they need our help, but we, we have to lend a hand, and, and that's it. Thank you. I want to address this to the captain. Um, you can probably answer this best, but when you catch the trafficker, the John and so on, um, how does the court handle it and support you, please? Okay, I gotta take the mic. So um, so we had initially set up a program uh, called the CARD program, which was, uh, for the lack of a better word, it's called a John School. And so we had some that were uh, arrested for the first time. It doesn't mean that they were necessarily first time offenders, but they had been arrested for the first time. Um, and our process in working with the judiciary uh, and, and the legislators was to um, have a, a program that we would run through the sheriff's department to have uh, a class where as part of their pretrial sentencing, they would have to attend this class. Um, I know, but there were certain criteria as far as um, whether or not you could be, you could participate. One, it was your first arrest um, and, you know, and there were fees associated with it. But um, that group, I think we, we ran through 50, 52, through those first few groups that we did, um, we had zero recidivism as far as their activity, again, within the city of Springfield, but, but we posted pictures, you know, we, we went on Mass Live or whatever social media outlets there were, and we posted pictures of people, um, and, you know, obviously there were other conversations that needed to be had for them at home, right? But, um, but we did, we had coaches and we had teachers and we had, and we had people that well beyond any, any prosecutorial um, process, there were people that lost their jobs, lost credibility. Um, and so uh, we had some that 
we ran four hotel stings and at all four we had one guy that got arrested at all four so he uh, I think he got about six years uh, for his so the problem was is that like everything else the the internet and social media um, the laws never really caught up to it like it was a whole new way of doing business so we didn't we didn't have a way of, of going after those um, those offenses uh, we did things called home rule legislation, which is like Springfield developed, you know, specific ordinances that then we had our state reps bring up and bring to Boston and change, actually change some of the sentencing and some of the charges and processes. So um, we, we've done a lot with regards to changing the framework of how people are prosecuted or, or um, rehabilitated, I guess, through the process. But we still have a ways to go. Hope that answers your question. So, in a different life, I used to work for Department of Ch Children and Families and also Department of Youth Services. Um, I didn't stay at Department of Youth Services for too long, but I worked in a juvenile detention center for young women who 90% of the girls that are in a juvenile detention center have been trafficked in Massachusetts. The problem with the juvenile detention center is that there is no answer on how to help them. Um, they are all frequent flyers. Um, they all go back to the world of selling themselves for money or going back to the person that's been trafficking them. There's, when you try to help them, Nobody really has an answer on how to prevent it from happening again and again and again. So I'm asking you help these girls and you help these children. What are your plans for trying to prevent them to going back to the life that they were living? Our plan, and thank you for your work, our plan is to, well, certainly we work with the older youth. So 17, 18, we've even worked with a 16-year-old, and we recently were trying to mentor a 14-year-old who was explaining. The thing that we have that's different, I think, is a survivor speaking to a victim, right? Like a person with lived experience, expertise, they call it, an LEE -E nowadays. If we have a person who's sitting in front of somebody who's being victimized or is even, yeah, caught up in a wrong thing, that person typically can help them understand that I was there and these are the things that I did and you can do this too. And that's where the underground starts to come in. The thing about children, I find, so the Department of Children and Families in Connecticut and probably in Massachusetts, they're gonna take care of their kids under a certain age, right? It's, the threshold tends to be 16, 17. And then, you know, just because they turn a day after, you know, just because they turn 18 doesn't make them any less of a victim, right? And, you know, that's where we come in. And the, the other thing I'll tell you, it's not about preventing them from going out because we always wanna give them agency. We want them to make a decision to be free. We'll give them all the tools they need. We will help with housing and food security. We will help with retraining, scholarships. We will do everything we can to help them stand in freedom. I mean, that's our work, and it's not like it's a one-year program. It's like a lifetime program. We're building a community of survivors. So, um what I wanted to say is that we have to take a look at the fact that, as you said, 90% of those young girls are in detention. Why are they there? How did they get there? How did their victimization sort of lead them into this place of being locked up and you know, criminalized for oftentimes crimes that they commit because they're being trafficked? Um, so that's one of the things just to think about, like how the system some, sometimes supports that. And what happens is when the traffickers are working with them, they tell them to mistrust the system, right? Like, they like literally tell them, like, okay, if you disclose anything, if you talk, if you do whatever, you're going to get arrested, you're going to get locked up, this is what they're going to do to you, you can't trust them. So when they're in those institutions, all they want to do is go back to the person that they think had their best interests at heart, because how am I a victim, but I'm locked up? 
right? How have I, you know, been victimized for so many years, um, have been violated so much, and the system now is saying it's my fault and I'm here. So we have to look at those psychological elements and how these young children are brainwashed and how those traffickers become the safe person in their life despite the fact that they're abusing them. So oftentimes you will see that relapse of, I'm out, but I don't know how to survive without that person. I don't know how to survive without that scenario because that's all I know. And that's the person who has been the most honest with me. And here's all these other people who say they care about me, but at the same time, they have me in captivity, right? So there's some of those dynamics that makes it so complicated to get people out of their life quickly. In my experience, the girls that I worked with, they didn't trust anybody, not even anybody who also was in sex trafficking or was victimized by it. But what the state does is they can't do anything, so now they're just gonna release the kids, they're gonna run away again, they're gonna go back to jail, and then they're gonna sit there again. There's, that's, it's like a vicious circle and you can't do anything about it. One thing is the cycle breaks, and I think one of the things with Love 146 in Connecticut that they talk about is they walk alongside victims no matter where they are. So once they are on their caseload, if they end up in detention, if they end up in residential, if they end up in foster care, they go there and they are a presence for them, they support them. I think one of the things that we always say, and this is why this work is hard and painful, is we're not gonna save everyone, right? Um, because sometimes the damage that has been done is too severe. You heard the, you know, mis the story of that young lady who um, ended up dying because you have overdose. One of the, the statistics that we talk a lot, a lot about is the lifespan for someone in their life is seven years. And it's seven years because either they're gonna get murdered um, or they're going to have an overdose because of the substance addiction issues that they have or because they contracted a disease that ends up taking their life. But when you have people who walk alongside, when you have programs like the Underground Survivor Care, they know there's someone there that is saying, I care about you and I'm going to be here with you no matter how many times you go back, no matter how many times you stumble, I'm going to be here to pick you back up. It's that level of support and intervention that eventually breaks that cycle. But what happens to a lot of the girls who stay in that cycle is because there's no one walking alongside of them that says, I care about you and I'm not gonna judge you, I'm not gonna criticize you, I'm gonna be here. The next time you feel unsafe, call me, right? I'll come get you, I'll come support you. The next time you feel like you don't know how you're gonna get through that day, call me and I'll show up and I'll help you and I'll guide you. That's what the Survivor Mentor Program does through the underground. That's some of the work that Love 146 does. And we see that people get out of the life when they have that level of consistent, supportive presence there for them because they're not being given up on. Right, and I think that when you guys decide to um, fully move into Massachusetts, you're gonna find that the funding for something like this is non-existent and you're gonna you're probably going to get a lot of red tape, but... Same thing. <laughs> and that's where donations come in, that's where you know, um, foundations and funding come in, because this is unconventional practice. This is not the traditional form of treatment, right? So you do have people who then pour into organizations like this and say, we're going to give our money to have an impact. So when Captain Brian talks about there's something you can do, you may not have the education, you may not feel like you could do counseling, you may not be able to take a position in this field, but you may have time and you may have money, right? And those are still resources that are needed to help victims get out of this life, right? And so, you know, always think about what can I do? Can I, if I can't give anything that I feel is substantial, but maybe that $5 that I have extra that I decide I want to donate, then that's going to help um, another victim get out of their life, right? So we know we're not going to get a lot of funding to do this kind of work because we've seen that. But what we know is that there's people who believe in survivors and making sure they're cared for, and that's what we have to um, utilize sometimes to show the systems that this approach actually works. And that's the beauty of the underground and the work that they're doing because the churches have supported it. And that, this has been a very unconventional approach, but it's the church uh, membership that supported this to now be able to have a story to tell that maybe a federal or state organization will fund something like this in other entities. Thank you, though, for your Hi, good evening. I'm Marilyn Richards. I'm on the town council here in East Long Meadow. I want to thank all of you for coming and for sharing your information. The subject is heavy, extremely heavy, with 
critical. My question is simple. Um, is there a universal sign or signal that a victim could use if traveling in a vehicle or in public transportation or in the mall or somewhere with a trafficker that they could communicate that they're in trouble and that maybe someone could recognize that? So there is, um, if you know, I don't know sign language that well and actually just saw an image, but it, I think it's like one is like this, it's like your, your, your signal in HT. So you do the letter H and then you do the letter, I think it was something like this was T. And that, there was a survivor because it was a news article where they did that and someone knew what they were signaling and was able to rescue them. But if you Google it or look it up online, you'll find it. But I think it's like H and then T um, or whatever. I don't know sign language, so I can't even pretend that I understand what I'm doing. Um, but it's, it's, it's that. And that was something that saved a survivor who was um, being trafficked. Can I also uh, let you all know, and thank you, um, Ms. Council person, for saying hello. Uh, we're grateful to be here. Uh, the Underground produces uh, prevention pieces. I have a little hotline card here. It's two-sided. We have the National Human Trafficking Hotline up for you. If you, if you want to jot it down, it's here. It's on our website. But these pieces give the National Human Trafficking Hotline number to anybody who's being victimized, they're gonna understand there's help, and then the flip side, there's more help. These bracelets are called We Are Young, and on the flip side, on the inside, the trafficking hotline is on here. So we have these pieces at our table. If you wanna take them with you, please do. There's also signage we can provide businesses. I know the Rotary Club sponsored this evening. You know, if you own a business, you can pop a sign up in the bathroom, especially girls' room is helpful, even boys' room. And we're about to do a major initiative in just a few weeks that Teresa's gonna to explain to you for as a next step to helping, and it has to do with outreach. Teresa, do you wanna explain that? Because you can do something within the next few weeks, because we plan on just keeping it going to try to get acquainted. Yeah. So I'll just say thank you again. I so appreciate you all. Thank you again for having us. I'm going to turn it over to Teresa. Um, thank our panelists tonight. If you want to give them a round of applause. <laughs> and um, I'm sure they'll stick around later if you have questions that you want to ask them. But um, I know that was a lot and it was really heavy. It was heavy for me and I've heard it dozens of times. Um, so we want to end tonight on a call to action. What can we do as a community um, to hear all that stuff? And like they said, what can we, how can we help? So what Rotary Club is going to be doing is we're hosting an event um, in, in, sorry, in February 23rd. It's going to be at the Council on Aging. And essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to get together as a Rotary Club and we're asking you as the community to get involved. And so what the underground and other organizations have done is they create care packs. And so these care packs have things like shampoo, um, soap, um, razors for women and men, um, anything that they can use like stress balls, um, adult coloring books. These care packs, we have a list here. And um, essentially what we're going to be doing is the Rotary Club is a grant and we're going to be building these care packs. And then we're going to be distributing them to uh, FAC, Family Advocacy Center. Um, who's in Springfield, and they're going to be distributing them to um, vulnerable youth in the region. And I'm not sure if the Springfield Police Department wants to uh, take several packs as well, but they're more than welcome to. But essentially what it is, it's a handout. It's saying, hey, we in the community care about you. Here's some things that we want to give you that will help. Um, it's small. It's a small act of kindness, but it's kindness nonetheless, which is a lot of these things that these kids probably don't experience on a regular basis. And in the care packs, we'll also have those cards that my mom um, mentioned in the bracelets for the human trafficking hotline. So again, the event is February 23rd. It's at the Council on Aging. What I would love for you to do is take one of these home, share it with your friends, family. And if you can make a pack, that would be fantastic. You could drop it off at the Council on Aging. You could also come join us that night as we build the packs as a Rotary Club. But um, yeah, it would just be incredible if we as a community could to get together and just take one action, take one step to help these kids. And hopefully we can do more as a community. But this is one actionable step we can take. So 
you have any questions, we'll be here. But um, I want to thank you all for coming again. And um, yeah, thank you all. <laughs>